for me. I'm a man. I'm 40. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Nick DiMartino. That's Anthony Ballister. Here's a new episode of Moving the Goalposts. You can follow me on Twitter at Nick DiMart. You can follow uh, Anthony at Ballister555. You can follow this show at MTGPETB on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. You can follow Empty the Bench Network on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at ETB Network. You can follow me at Nick D. Uh, yeah, I just said that at Nick DiMart on Twitter. Uh, you can follow... Uh, you can find you can follow Empty the Bench. Uh, you can follow all the Empty the Bench podcasts on et on youtube.com slash etb network. You can listen to all Empty the Bench podcasts at etbpodcast.com. And you can listen to Moving the Gold Posts wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure to like and subscribe. And of course, uh, Moving the Gold, this show, Moving the Gold Post, is presented by Playback. Watching sports is more fun with others, but we spend too much of our time watching alone. Playback is a virtual space where communities can stream live sports together with everyone perfectly synced up. Creators can hop on stage, deliver their own play-by-play analysis and commentary, and invite viewers up for Q&A. Playback makes watching sports fully interactive and a social experience. From playing fantasy sports, repping your favorite players and teams, and watching with the commentators and communities you care about. Win or lose, sports are best enjoyed together. Join our community by going to playback.tv slash ETV network to find out more, including our live stream schedule. All right. So there's a lot going on with the Olympics. Uh, uh, you know, just uh, I like the I mean, look, I really like the Olympics in a, uh, a lot of ways. What I like about the Olympics is this. Um, I think to most Americans, only three sports exist. Baseball, football and basketball. And the Olympics doesn't have two of those. <laughs> like, uh, I don't I don't know uh, how much of it you saw. Noah Lyles just won another gold medal. He uh, he won. Like, I don't know if you saw the video of the race. He was like, he won by 0. 0.05. So five milliseconds, basically. Uh, if you look at the end of it, it's like they're all like you can't even tell who won. They didn't even know who won after like immediately after the race. Yeah, honestly, uh, it was super close. And uh, like you said, a lot of people don't pay attention to the Olympics. Um, I really think pe more people should. I mean, it's an honor to, you know, do anything for your country and to represent them. Um, and it only comes once every four years. So there's a lot at stake, um, you know, for people who don't follow and just watch one sport. Imagine if the World Series or the Super Bowl or the Stanley Cup was once every four years. Imagine how much, you know, more determined and how much more of those players would want to win that because you don't get too many opportunities. And Olympic athletes, they don't have a long, you know, shelf life. A lot of these people only have, you know, up until the end of their 20s. You know, most of them have to retire in, at 30 years old. So you really only got a few opportunities at this. Um, and I, may, I think that makes the Olympics very, very compelling to watch. And I was really, really uh, impressed with uh, Noah Lyles. Um, you know, I was confident that he was going to win coming into this. And, man, you don't get a much uh, closer race than that. Um, I was very, very happy for him, but um, I was definitely disappointed in the guy who lost. Um, you know, he thought he won, and for you to train that long and wait four years and to lose that, you know, closely, definitely had to be disappointing. Yeah. It, it, well, what I like about the racing is it is one of the few – because, like, in sports, like, what we're used to is everything – every match being like a marathon, like a, like a football game is three hours, basketball game, two and a half hours. Everything is like, or even if you go to individual sports that we watch golf, tennis, whatever, it's all like, it's all something of an extended period of time. I, like, I know football plays are all like short bursts, but this would be like, if 
one foot, like, like every football play is short, like, you know, a matter of seconds, really. But there's multiple of them over a course of a few hours. In the Olympics, this racing, it's just you hear the gun go off and you go. And within like a minute of like within seconds, the race is over. And it's all like by the tiniest margins, by like hairs. It is like I, I don't even know how they determine it. It feels just bizarre. No, Lyles, he set a record, right? I want to make. He, he um, I'm, a, not, I'm not sure if he broke the okay. uh, Usain Bolt's record, but he definitely had a really good time. Right, right, right. No, I meant like a record for medals. Um, I think so. Um, he's definitely a very accomplished uh, Olympic athlete. Um, and like you said, um, you know, Nick, you know, you trained four years for you know nine seconds to potentially uh, change your life. Um, yeah. And it's definitely, uh, you know, really crazy to uh, you know put that all in perspective. Yeah, yeah, no, obviously. I mean, you train your whole life for that. And, and like and like you said, it's once every four years. I mean, it, it's obviously your whole life, but like that's what you're training for. You're training. So you're training your whole life for once every four years. I mean, this time, this time it feels a little different. It sort of feels like the Olympics just happened in a way because it was three years ago and not four years ago. Um, and then it was the Winter Olympics. I mean, I, I think the Summer Olympics way better than the Winter Olympics. The Winter Olympics, I, I don't think, is close to as good. Although the Winter Olympics does have a lot of uh, – it does have, I would say, otter sports in there. Um, I mean, I, I think that the basketball this year was a little more interesting. Then uh, The uh, Team USA just beat Brazil. Uh, we have a whole bunch of stars on the Team USA roster that would be uh, starters. Uh, not just starters, but leaders – on a lot of NBA teams that hardly get any playing time on Team USA. I, I mean, it makes sense that, that we're kind of like a dream team in a sense because we Team USA has all the stars and <laughs> has all the NBA stars. Um, I yeah, don't know. They're, I, they're definitely the the team yeah. of um, you know all NBA players. Um, and you know, honestly, um, when I looked at the uh, the bracket um, for you know the the, the playoff tournament um, for this uh, men's basketball. It looked like USA had a very, very easy path. Um, I mean, basically, they just had to beat Brazil, which I was pretty confident that they would do that. Um, now they're going to have to play Serbia. I think they're going to run through that. So they got lucky. They didn't have to, you know, go up against uh, a France and a Germany or and a Canada. They're only going to have to play potentially one of those teams in the finals. And I think that's going to serve them well. They're going to be super, super fresh for the finals. Um, I think right now it's probably going to end up being France and USA, um, but I don't see anything stopping USA right now. Yeah, well, I think I think this year's basketball in the Olympics is a little bit more interesting than it's been in the past because it's not just Team USA. It's kind of like it's Team USA and some other teams that also can compete because they also have NBA players, although I still don't think any of them are. I mean, like Canada was also supposed to be able to compete with Team USA, and they're already out. Um, Serbia, I would say they have Jokic and then a bunch of Serbian non NBA players. So I, I guess Jokic can do a lot to carry the team, but he's still playing by himself completely. And by the way, he was on the Nuggets. He's on the Nuggets and they couldn't beat the Timberwolves. So, I mean, if they, if he couldn't beat the Timberwolves with, uh, the, like on an NBA roster, one of the better NBA rosters in the NBA, he, they were the number one seed. Um, I'm sorry, the number two seed. Uh, I mean, what makes me think they are they can beat like a team of NBA superstars? And some of them aren't even playing. I mean, Tatum, I mean, I don't know if I call him a superstar per se, but Tatum and Embiid, who are clear starters, they are leaders on their teams, or Tatum, arguably. Uh, they're not even playing. They're hardly even playing. They're bench players on Team USA. Um you know, I mean, like we did the playback stream. I was on the playback stream uh, for the second half of Team USA and uh, against Brazil. Um, the spread, I think, was like 26 points, 26 and a half points. Like that's how big the spread was. I, I mean, like Brazil is just not an NBA team. I mean, how many NBA players are on Team Brazil? There, there aren't that many. There's maybe one or two. Um, I, I mean, I know the NBA has a history of having Brazilian players, but like it, there's maybe like one or two. Uh, yeah, so, it's, it's definitely uh, an unfair advantage, but that's how it usually is with Team USA. And I know, you know, there's definitely a lot of international players entering the NBA, and a lot of them have came from France 
But if you really look at it, it's kind of more spread out. Yeah, there's a lot of international players, but a lot of them are all from different countries themselves. So it's not like they're all on one team playing against Team USA. So Team USA is definitely going to be stacked. And honestly, the only way Team USA ever loses in the Olympics is if they beat themselves, is if they're not playing team ball. You know, the one thing that always does hurt Team USA is all these players are superstars and have been superstars their entire lives. So they're always being known for being the man and being the person who has to have the ball and be able to score all the points. So when you put them all together, sometimes it's hard for them to mesh and have that team chemistry. Um, but this uh, USA team doesn't seem to be like that. They seem to be playing as one, um, which makes them even more dangerous. Um, but like I said, the only way they're going to lose is they beat themselves. And right now that seems very unlikely. Right. Well, the thing is, I, I think the reason they're meshing well is because you know, the players that are dominating Team USA are veterans. It's LeBron, Durant, Curry. It's it's all uh, Anthony Davis. It, it really is the veterans that are doing it. So they have a certain level of maturity that younger players don't. Um, it still is managing big egos, by the way. Like, like, that still always is a bit of a challenge. I think it's a good problem to have, in a sense. Like, because you're if you're managing big egos – because they're stars, I guess that's kind of a good problem to have because you have a, you obviously have a stacked roster. That's what it means. Uh, but no, that is a real, actual like challenge uh, from from coaching these teams is that you're dealing with big personalities and guys that are just not used to having a lesser role on a team. That's always like that, that's always really been a th been an issue. And you know, it's not as simple as adding up all the players, adding up a bunch of star players, and that's how good the team is, is that, like, players' roles dissipate a little bit with other guys coming in, with, with other – so, it, you know, that math changes a, a little bit too. Um, but so far, Team USA has been pretty dominant. People were talking about them almost losing to South Sudan, uh, which honestly was a, was a bit of a shock. South Sudan is a pretty random country to almost lose to it's not like they almost lost to france or uh canada or something that might make sense because they have i mean france they have a lot of nba players but they're all very young uh it seems like i mean like i, I don't think france's team really could be that good compared to team usa they don't have the stars that team usa has and when you bring up international players you do make, bring up a good point we tend to think of sort of international players and American players, but really they come from all different countries. Like Jokic is Serbian, but he's like the only Serbian basketball player active in the NBA from what I, I, I could be wrong about that, but that's what I, he's the only one I know of. Yeah. <laughs> like, and I think the only country, but obviously like you said right now, that may be able to be the one country that seems to be having a lot of players come through is France. But a lot of these guys have just entered the NBA and entered the league within the last couple of years or so. So these are 19 to 23-year-old kids. I think maybe when the next Olympic trials come around, I think maybe France can be a serious threat, especially if Victor Wamanyama does become the best player in the league. Um, you know, and Alex Sarr and some of these other guys that came in the draft this year pan out. Um, France can be a team um, to be reckoned with, and maybe they may be the one, you know, country that can be the B to USA's A. But right now, um, it's, it's all spread out. France is too young. And right now, Team USA, I think, is going to continue to dominate like they usually do. Yeah, I mean, there's a few veteran players. I'm looking at their roster right now. Obviously, they have Wembenyama. Um, honestly, I've hardly seen Wembenyama play. I don't know how good he's going to be, but there's a lot of talk about him. Uh, the sports media seems to love him. And I'm not saying they're wrong. Uh, he might very well be turn out to be a big star. I mean, they have, Nick, Nick, uh, they have Evan Fournier on the team, former Nick. Um, Though he's he's a veteran, I would say they uh, like I said, Nick Batum uh, and Rudy Go Rudy Gobert and another former Nick Frank Natilakina uh, on on uh, Team France. Evan Fournier was bad against every when he was on the Knicks. He was bad against every team except for the Celtics uh, for some odd reason. <laughs> yeah, Nick. If uh, if you uh, you know, I would definitely um, you know encourage you to definitely check out more of Victor Wamanyama. He's an unbelievable talent. I'm not saying he could potentially be this. You know, when you make comparisons like this and projections, most of the time it doesn't come true. And, you know, as a rookie, obviously he had his growing pains. But if you really want to talk about talent and ceiling for a guy like Victor Wamanyama, I mean, the guy is just about seven foot five. Offensively, he's got the ceiling of Kevin Durant. 
and defensively he's got the ceiling of Giannis. So imagine if you had if you could play defensively like Giannis, offensively like KD, and also be seven foot five. Um, that's the type of talent we're talking about. And if he does maximize that talent, um, he could be maybe that next LeBron where he's just the best player in the league for a decade plus and maybe one of those all-time greats. But it's hard to put that pressure on a kid like that, and we'll just have to see how his career goes from here. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's 20 years old. So we don't know. And he, he's 20 years old and is on a really bad team. I think that next year's NBA season will – He'll be like a constant story, a little bit like the a little bit like Caleb Williams, which we'll get to in a little bit. Like they, they're they're young, unproven, raw, and talented, and they will 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 be a story, especially now that Chris Paul's on his team, is his <laughs> point guard, which makes a huge difference. Just having a good point guard and veteran leadership, uh, obviously, will will definitely make a big difference. Um, 100%. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, the Olympics, it's like, it, honestly, because Team USA is just so good, you and not so much this year, but just in general, the basketball is often the least interesting because we watch basketball all the time anyway. And this is like, and Team USA is just so good that, you know, it, it's the ultimate, basically, usually the ultimate NBA team versus countries that many of them hardly have any NBA players yeah. like it, like like so it does look like kind of a joke at times so <laughs> for many years basketball and not so much this year because it basketball's such a growing sport and within the recent like surge of international like Fran uh, all, specifically like French and Canadian players it's been a bit more interesting now that Canada's out it's a bit less interesting I would say um, but you know, a, a lot of things that we don't like, I love watching diving. Diving is unbelievable. Uh, like I, I, I can't say that, uh, I, I would agree with you on that one. I mean, I, uh, I can see why people like it and I can see the beauty of it. Um, but I definitely think that there would be a few other things that I would put on my TV before, uh, diving, if I'm being honest. Well, I, I think that there's a lot of sports that you don't normally, I mean, they, there's sports in the Olympics that I didn't know even were sports that existed. They're shooting at the Olympics. Shooting. Uh, I don't know if you saw the viral picture of the Turkish guy who won gold. Just pointing a gun. <laughs> he was like in his, I think he's like in his 50s and is an Olympian. Yeah, I That's saw the memes he, of, uh, all over social media about it. Yeah. Uh, and so you see that all the time. I mean, like you just see sports all the time that you didn't even know, know existed. Or, or things that you're just not usually used to watching. Yeah. Um, which is what I enjoy about it because you're, it, it is nice to see those things because you know you're not going to see it in a long time. Now, if they were on all year round, you would never think to like even turn it on. But because you don't get a chance to watch Olympics gymnastics uh, throughout the whole year, you're going to want to turn it on for this period of time. Um, yeah, that's 100% a great, a great point. You know, we like we said, we don't see these things too often. And, you know, scarcity and rarity – definitely you know makes uh anything um you know more exciting to watch right right and um you know u.s olympics gymnastics was uh an another pretty big story uh with simone biles winning gold and uh it, she actually fell off the beam uh the other day uh it, there were uh basically the, the weird thing about gymnastics is it's uh there's no score i, I mean there's scoring but it's all by judges which makes it like a little different from what we're used to. It's it, it's almost like an artistic sport. Like there's, it's like the dunk, it's like the dunk contest in a sense. Yeah, I mean, as as a UFC fan, I'm kind of used to that because uh, a lot of UFC fights, if they don't get decided in the octagon, they get scored by judges by three round, um, by three rounds or five rounds. Um, and a lot of the scoring systems very similar. They give you know one to ten. It's usually you know eight, nine, ten. They usually get per round. Um, so it's kind of very similar. So I'm used to that kind of scoring system. Um, but Simone is the GOAT. Um, you know, she won another Olympic gold medal at the age of 27. Now, to a lot of people, um, and, you know, in general, yeah, 27 is a very young age. But in her sport, 27 is like 47 in the NFL. So what she's done and what she's accomplished in, the, in her career 
is nothing short of amazing. And I think she's definitely the greatest gymnastics of all time. And I don't think no one's ever going to surpass her or catch her in the sport. Yeah. How many, how many gold medals in total does she have? I know it's quite a few, and I know it's definitely the record. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, and like, like I said, well, there were a few different, right? Which is like the thing with gymnastics is like, I guess to me because to us because we're novices, they all kind of look the same. The routines they look very similar. It's all doing a bunch of crazy flips on the beam. Uh, I mean, we know that if you fall off the beam, that's not good. But <laughs> I mean. We know that much, but it's just like, it's just a weird sport to watch because it's not like football where, you know, a team scores a touchdown. All right. You know, that's good. They scored a touchdown. It doesn't really matter that much how cool you looked while doing it. Yeah. Um, that That's like the whole thing with gymnastics and diving is that you got to look cool while doing it. Uh, it's all about the style points, I guess. Um, yeah. I mean, Suni Lee's and she, she's another young gymnast. She's like, 21 i think uh the, the american gymnast yeah uh and she also fell off the beam uh yeah it, and got back up um i, I don't know I, I guess that happened I, I guess that happens more often than we think i mean it's not exactly an, it's not exactly an easy thing to do do a bunch of crazy flips on a balanced beam i guess it happens to the best of them yeah well uh, obvious obviously it obviously it does uh they're and you know, there's tennis, and the Djokovic just won gold. Uh, a lot of the stuff is on Peacock. Uh, a lot of, uh, and also a lot of the Olympics is also on uh, USA Network. Um, I mean, I, I, for me, the hardest things to watch in the Olympics are things like the marathon running and the uh, the bike riding. Uh, thing like things that are so slow and don't have any sort of immediate sort of um score or immediate outcome i would say are the hardest but things like like track and diving and gymnastics like all of that i think is like the most entertaining yeah i agree with you 100 percent on that um you think we'll ever see baseball in the olympics um i'd hope so but it doesn't seem like it's uh very no very likely i'd say no way because the i i I mean, MLB players, I mean, maybe if you only had amateurs, MLB players in the Olympics, I feel like the owners would not be cool with that. Definitely not. Not with the contracts that they're paying these guys. Yeah. So yeah, it would, it would be like the world baseball classic and things like that. Um, all right. So there's a little, a little more about Jim Harbaugh football stuff. Jim Harbaugh says he had nothing to do with the sign stealing. I don't think this whole sign stealing thing is really that big of a deal. I think every team probably does this. Um, it's just sort of a common thing. Uh, he is also apparently in trouble for having contact with recruits during COVID. Um, he's not even a college coach anymore. So he might come back to coach, coach college at some point, but right now he's an NF. He, he returned to the NFL. Um, it, it's just a typical, it seems like a very typical, like, uh, uh, it, it seems like a, a, a very typical, just sort of NCAA thing. Uh, I don't know if you if you had a, I don't know if you're a Michigan hater or not. <laughs> no, actually, uh, I don't hate Michigan at all. Um, I really don't hate any team, um, unless if they're maybe in the SEC. Um, but um, yeah, I actually like Jim Harbaugh. Um, you know, I've been a fan of him. I've been an advocate of him. I remember before, early on, when they were losing to Ohio State, and people were saying Jim Harbaugh should be fired. Um, I was always stating that. Um, you know. Michigan can't do any better than Jim Harbaugh, and he's the best thing that, you know, ever happened to them. Um, they're pretty much in purgatory for a little while, and they kind of were becoming irrelevant. Um, as soon as Jim Harbaugh got there, he built, rebuilt them. And that's pretty much what Jim Harbaugh's done everywhere he goes. Um, he did great at Stanford. Um, he did good with uh, the 49ers, and he did good with Michigan. I, I also think he's going to do good with the Chargers. Um, and just like what, what you said, Nick, I don't think, um, you know, the sign stealing, you know, made a factor. I think last year it was, you know, definitely for sure that Michigan was the best team. I said a preseason that Michigan was the best team, and a lot of other people predict uh, Michigan to win the championship. They had super, super good talent all across the board, um, and Jim Harbaugh was coaching those guys. Um, so, and a lot of these, you know, sign stealing allegations are were against, you know, a group of five teams that honestly Michigan probably could beat in their sleep. Um, I know some of those games, you know, were closer than what we expected. 
But at the end of the day, I think Michigan was going to win the championship one way or another. Obviously, if they did break some rules, punishments have to be made. Jim Harbaugh's in the NFL right now, so it wouldn't affect him too much. Um, if he does decide to go back to college, then I guess it will affect him, and he may have a suspension looming, uh, looming over him. Um, but I think it does put maybe Michigan currently in a tough position. Um, you know, their new head coach, Moore, um, needs every help that he could get. Um, and, you know, now that uh, he may be looking at a suspension, um, that definitely could hurt Michigan right now. I'm not sure if they have someone that could replace him um, for a long period of time. So I don't think it hurts Harbaugh at all, um, but it probably hurts the current Michigan team as we speak. Yeah, it probably does because Sharon Moore supposedly was involved in this. I've heard. Um, yeah, I've heard that there was allegations of him deleting yeah. text messages, but he was probably just doing that to help Jim Harbaugh. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, like my view is not that Jim Harbaugh had nothing to do with this. I don't believe that. I never really believe that, like, low-level employees are just going rogue like that without being told. Uh, when Jim Harbaugh runs the show, like, like that just is what I, it, it, what is the most believable to me. Um, like, it just doesn't sound like something that a low-level employee would do by himself. Um, so, no, I, it's not that I don't believe Jim Harbaugh didn't. It's not that I totally believe Jim Harbaugh. It's just that, like, I, I don't think it's that big of a deal. It is is the main point that I'm making. Uh, like, yeah, I just don't think it's that big of a deal. And you're right about Harbaugh. Harbaugh, Harbaugh is. I think the best thing to ever happen to Michigan, at least in my lifetime, because for a while, Michigan was a joke. They were before Harbaugh, they were a laughing stock. And Jim Harbaugh turned the team around overnight. And I thought the dumbest narrative was the Harbaugh is overrated narrative for a while. Um, that was a common now. Now, obviously, it's just like nobody seems to think that anymore. It's one of those things where people once believed it, now nobody does because of how it was just proven to be wrong. And I think when you look at college football coaches I or college coaches in general, the best way to judge them is, all right, in the context of how bad was the team the year before and how are they now? Uh, he made them contenders overnight. Uh, in he went nine and three in 2015. Uh, it, it, like that, that's it, like, it, it was a tremendous turnaround and for a while. And, you know, for many years, not maybe not every year, but they were one of the best teams in college football for a while uh, since Harbaugh took over. So yeah, he's been tremendous as a head coach. Yeah. And I think, you know, what it was is I don't think it was necessarily the record. It's just when you coach at Michigan and Ohio state, that game, you know, means everything. That's why we're seeing now it's the opposite. Now that Ryan Day's lost a few times to Michigan, now Ryan Day's the one that's being talked about being on the hot seat. So it was just basically the Michigan losses to Ohio State. But you, people got to look at it. You know, Jim Harbaugh was facing an uphill battle. When he first went in there, there was no comparison in recruiting and talent. Ohio State was much more talented than Michigan for a long period of time. And maybe still to this day, they're more talented. And, you know, with all the receivers and all their great quarterbacks and offensive players that um, Ohio State had, you know, at first it was hard for Jim Harbaugh and Michigan to compete with that. They were never going to have the offense and never had the receiver talent um, or maybe not even the quarterback talent as great as McCarthy was to beat a team like Ohio State. So what Jim Harbaugh did was absolutely genius. You know, he couldn't beat, you know, Ohio State at their own game. So he decided to change the script. He decided, you know, I'm going to beat you by having a great power offensive line. I'm going to have a great defense. I'm going to run the ball down your throat. I'm going to have great tight ends. And I'm going to have a quarterback that's smart and doesn't turn the ball over. And that seemed to be the exact, you know, recipe to beat Ohio State. And that's why he's beat them the last few times in a row. So a lot of people need to look at what Jim Harbaugh did. And I think he's going to do very similar things for the Chargers. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, th th that's interesting because I, I think that – uh yeah, you, you brought up a lot of points there. I think that people are talking – I mean, the problem with college football is I think that coaches are often held to unrealistic standards in, in a sense. It's like, yeah, Ryan Day – okay, like Jim Harbaugh was able to turn around the whole Michigan not being able to beat Ohio State thing, which to most Michigan fans is probably the most important thing. and That and winning a national championship, which, which before Harbaugh, the idea of Michigan winning a national championship – just felt so like I don't know how I would compare it, but I guess it would be like Michigan thinking of Michigan State winning a national championship now because that's what Michigan was ten years ago. They were Michigan, what Michigan State is now, just a complete mess. 
And he, he single-handedly turned it around. I mean, and as for Ryan Day, it's like, I, I think that Ryan Day gets a bit of a raw deal. He gets a bit of a raw deal because, like, if he uh, – I think Ryan Day is that, like, he's taking over for Urban Meyer, who is an all-time great head – who is an all-time great head coach. Um, it, it, like, one of the best – I mean, like, I would like to see him coach again. Uh, I think that he is – I think Urban Meyer is, seems like a very anxious, um, intense person, and I'm under the impression that he just doesn't want to – handle it that much like like i'm just sort of under that impression about urban meyer that it's just a lot for him um although i think he probably could coach again but i don't know the thing is is that ryan day also came around when it was right around the same time while harbaugh was michigan's head coach so urban meyer did have a bit of an advantage that for a lot of the time that he was again that he was playing michigan Michigan stunk. They weren't even, even though they're the biggest rival, they they weren't much competition to them. Um, And Ryan Day, I think, is often, like, I don't think he's a bad head coach. He's just not quite as good as Urban Meyer, and he's not quite as good as Harbaugh. But Harbaugh is one of the three best coaches in college football, or was when he was, I mean, he's not coaching college football now, but he was. Like, I would say Saban, Kirby Smart, and then Harbaugh over, like, over these past couple of years. So it's just not totally fair because, uh, you know, it, it, and by the way, you're an Alabama fan. The same thing's going to happen with Alabama. I mean, Kalen DuBoer, everybody's going to be talking about how he's no Nick Saban. And it's like, yeah, he's not Nick Saban, but nobody is Nick Saban. Like, like it's not really always going to be fair like that. Yeah, I 100% agree. And I feel bad for Kalen DeBoer. You know, I – I really hope, uh, you know, other Alabama fans are happy just, you know, be competitive throughout the season, maybe sneak into the playoffs. Even if we get smothered um, in week uh, in the first round of the playoffs, I think that's a great season for his first year. Um, you know, Kalen DeBoer definitely seems to be recruiting well so far, so I'm definitely, you know, optimistic. But, yeah, Ryan Day definitely has unfair uh, expectations. And, honestly, he's done pretty well. His kicker um, was a field goal away, I think, from winning the national championship. Uh, I predicted that season um, in C.J. Stroud's final season with Ohio State that I thought Ohio State was going to win the national championship. They had a very, very competitive game with Georgia in the semifinals, and their kicker was a, uh, a short yard field goal away miss, and they would have won that game. And we all know Ohio State would have destroyed TCU in the national championship. I don't know about that. Uh, I, don't I don't know, know man. That. I mean, they, they were real close with Georgia, and then Georgia stomped TCU in the national championship game. Yeah, but it doesn't really work that way. It's not linear. College football is not linear. You also have to remember the fact that TCU also beat Michigan. So we, we don't really know what would have happened. I mean, I think Georgia that year just – Georgia was very good that year. Um, and you know what? I think that the, the way it really works is that, like, like I said, it's not so linear like that. It's like – the, pr- the problem with that are – I mean, maybe they could have beaten TCU if they had beaten Georgia. I don't I don't know. But, th- you know, the spread was like 10 – it wasn't that big. Like, Georgia, they ended up beating TCU by a lot. But going into the game, they weren't expected to. So we don't really know what would have happened. Um, had, I mean, look, maybe Ohio State would have beaten TCU. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. But, yeah, you're right. Uh, in general, like the general point you're making is correct. That oh, It's not like Ohio State's fallen off since Ryan Day has taken over. They're still one of the most competitive teams. Like, they're still expected to make the playoffs every year. So it's just sort of – and by the way, there were times when Urban Meyer was head coach and they didn't make the playoffs. Like, you know, it happens, I guess. I mean, now with the 12-team playoff, it's different. So, I mean, they're almost guaranteed to make the playoffs. Um, but, you know, these with the 14-team playoff, it, it was obviously, um, I would say, a little different. Yeah, and, you know, for Ohio State, what other options are there? There may be some great coaches out there, but honestly, I don't think you're going to find a coach better than Ryan Day. So you might as well keep him as the head coach. They've been right there every year. Honestly, in my opinion, I think this is going to be Ryan Day's most talented team. Um, You know, obviously we'll talk about more about that as the season goes on. Um, But I think he's got a great opportunity this year um, to win it all. And I think, you know, he's got a very talented team. And I think at some point Ryan Day – um, you know, will, you know, push through and, you know, get the national championship, just like we saw Jim Harbaugh do um, with Michigan. 
Yeah, I think, and that would obviously, and, and that would change everything. Like if he can, if, if Ryan Day, like, well, now that Harbaugh is gone, I think it, like it's great for Ryan Day because obviously like with Harbaugh being gone, there's a good chance that Michigan's program will go downhill. Um, not overnight, I don't think, but it likely will go downhill because what we've seen is that when really good coaches leave, they go, it, like the programs are just not the same after they leave. Uh, just like they, just like college football programs get, considerably better when good coaches come in like Alabama I think might be different because you're replacing Nick Saban with another very good head coach another very accomplished head coach Sharon Moore is not an, I'm not saying he's bad but he's not an accomplished head coach he's that he, he's never uh he he was a coordinator so it, 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 it Michigan might be in a might be in that position um and and that and that would obviously like be that that would obviously just be amazing for Ryan Day's legacy if he can turn the whole thing back around, which he's really just a lot of Ohio State fans are just expecting him to do. Yeah. Um. So, uh, I don't. I'm just sort of, you know, I, I also think that the uh and the uh Jim Jim Harbaugh. I think that in the NFL this year, there's going to be a lot of storylines. One of them is going to be. Harbaugh coaching the Chargers, which is, you know, has been one of, first of all, there's a few things. Harbaugh is one of the few head coaches to have success in the NFL and college football. Very few other head coaches have been able to have done it. Um, I'm not saying they're the only ones who are capable. Nick Saban didn't have success in the NFL. That's because he was only a head coach in the NFL for a couple of years. Um, I think uh, Jim Harbaugh, um, like you say, he's one of those rare guys. Um, I think he compares a lot to maybe like Pete Carroll. We've seen a guy like Pete Carroll have success at USC yeah. and then also have success with the Seattle Seahawks. Um, so it's definitely been done before, but it's definitely super, super rare. 99% of these guys are usually good at one thing and not at the other. Um, so what Jim Harbaugh has done shows that it doesn't matter what the game is. If it involves football, he's going to coach it, and he's going to coach it well. I yeah. think it's a great um, fit for the Chargers, um, particularly where they're, where they're at. Um, as I stated before, what he did with Michigan was build that great offensive line get that defense going, and have great tight ends. I think that's exactly what, uh, you know, Justin Herbert and the Chargers need. They need someone to get the most out of that talented defense that, you know, obviously Staley couldn't get out of. They're super talented, but they always were coming up short, so they need to get um, a coach that can really get them on track. The Carball will do that. Justin Herbert needs to be protected from the offensive line. You know Jim Harbaugh is going to get that done. He's going to have some great tight ends. And, you know, a lot of time, you know, the Chargers have had injuries at wide receivers and maybe they lack at that position. But Jim Harbaugh doesn't have to have elite wide receivers to be talented and have a talented team that wins. I mean, I think he's a great fit because I think he's going to give Herbert and the Chargers exactly what they need to compete in the AFC West with the Kansas City Chiefs. Well, yeah, th I, I think the biggest downside for the Chargers right now is that their division is just too good. I mean, namely the fact that they have to compete with the Chiefs. Uh, doesn't mean they. I mean, look, there's three wild card teams. Doesn't mean they can't. Uh, doesn't mean they can't be a wild. Doesn't mean they can't make the wild card. But if uh, I think that the storyline is going to be because you, the way you have to view it is like the Chargers had pretty much everything going for them, other than the fact, obviously, that they weren't the Chiefs. And that their head coach was notoriously bad. Brandon Staley has, I mean, other than Nathaniel Hackett, has tarnished his record. I mean, every couple of years we see it. Almost every year, actually. There's a head coach that completely tarnishes his reputation. And Brandon Staley was that guy over the past couple of years. And that was, at least the narrative was for the Chargers, that the biggest problem they had was the lack of a head coach, I would say. And you also have to consider the fact that they have a young, good young quarterback, but unproven. A young quarterback, but unproven, who has, who shows a lot of ability. Um, and keep in mind, Brandon Staley was a defensive-minded head coach. He, and most of the time, it, like teams with young quarterbacks often like, to have offensive minded head coaches, especially not even just offensive minded head coaches. Cause you can be an offensive minded head coach and not really run a very good offense, but an offensive minded head coach like Harbaugh, who is proven to actually 
be able to run. I mean, e- even though Michigan was more of a defensive team, who, who's proven to be able to run offenses uh, in the NFL, which he's and, and develop young quarterbacks, which he's been able to do. And he and that is a huge plus for Justin Herbert. Uh, it's just going to be weird, interesting to me to me to, to see the story because you know the NFL season is long. It is a long ass season, and it's just going to be you know the storylines and ESPN and the media and everything are going to be about Harbaugh and is Harbaugh doing a good job? And it's going to be after a couple of games. And is this really the right fit? Uh, like it, it's just you know it's it, it's just going to be sort of interesting to see how he develops this team. Yeah, and you know there's a pro and a con of being in the AFC West. Obviously, the biggest count of them all is you got to play the Chiefs twice a year. Obviously, the Chiefs are the team to beat, um, and they're tough, the toughest team to beat for a reason. Um, especially when you got the combination of Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid, they're going to be tough to beat. But when you look at the rest of the division, Nick, um, you know the AFC West outside of Kansas City might be one of the weakest divisions in the AFC. The AFC's got a lot of strong divisions, like the AFC North, that's pretty strong. Um, I think the AFC East, um, outside the Patriots, is pretty strong. I think if Aaron Rodgers is healthy. All three of those teams can compete. But with the uh, the AFC West, outside of the Chargers of Kansas City, um, I'm not sure if I'm super confident in the Denver Broncos and the Las Vegas Raiders this season. I feel like both those teams are kind of in transition. Um, I do like the potential of Bo Nix with Sean Payton, but he's a rookie quarterback. I think they're maybe a year or two away. And I'm not sure the Raiders have the answer at quarterback yet. The Raiders might have a competitive defense, but I'm not sure if the Raiders have the quarterback of the future. So that should make things a little bit easier for Jim Harbaugh. The fact that he'll have, you know, probably four, you know, easier, you know, games. But then on the flip side, he's going to have two hard ones against the Chiefs. Yeah, no, no, no. You're, you're right about that. Like those are two. I mean, the truth is, though, it's sort of in his favor because the Chiefs are just so dominant that they're not even even expected to beat them. Like even if they lose to the Chiefs twice, I don't think it would really be that big of a deal. It, like, that's just you know, it, it's not even really that big of a deal if they don't get home field in the playoffs i mean it's going to hurt him obviously on some level but like it, he's not really expected to and yeah I, agree. yeah I mean like i don't think i mean people talk about like being able to coach in college and in the nfl like pete carroll and jim harbaugh were the only ones able to do it i mean i think that nick saban probably could have done it too he was just not a head coach for a long period of time he was only the dolphins head coach for like three years and I think it's the – and Drew Brees was supposed to go to the Dolphins, but he failed his physical, So, which I think is the biggest what-if question in the history of sports. I mean, maybe if Drew Brees had went to the Dolphins, he would have won a bunch of championships with the Dolphins, uh, or at least one or two. And that would have uh, – and his whole reputation as not being able to coach in the NFL would have been vastly different. So we don't really know. I mean, Bill Belichick couldn't win with the Browns, and if his career ended there – then we would think of Bill Belichick as a crappy head coach rather than like the best head coach of all time. So, uh, you know, I, I just don't know if there's uh, like, I think that people with Nick Saban off, often claim, Oh, well he could have coached in the NFL. Like that's obviously not totally true. Um, uh, yeah. It's just, you know, he's just going to be one of the storylines in the NFL this year. It's going to be, it, Harbaugh is going to be one of them. Another one of the storylines. Now I have a lot of PTSD with this. Uh, Sam Darnold was named the Vikings starting quarterback. I hope they don't have any ghosts in Minnesota. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I'm not really surprised. Sam Darnold's a veteran of the game. I think he's definitely learned a lot. Um, you know, he's had some elite um, head coaches that he's got to learn under over the last uh, few years. Um, so I think they're going to get the best version of Sam Darnold. Sam Darnold really didn't get a fair chance. Not saying that he was a great quarterback, had a lot of accuracy and inconsistency, uh, inconsistency issues. But there, he was—he didn't have a lot working for him. He didn't play with this same Jets team that the Jets have now. Um, he didn't have a lot to work with. So you can't put all the blame on Sam Donald. Like I said, I don't think he would have been great um, if he had, you know, superior talent either. Um, but he definitely could have been better than what he showed. But like I said, he's been around the league a little bit. He's had a lot of, you know, great offensive coaches that he could take a lot of advice from. And right now, I don't think J.J. McCarthy is ready. He's 21 years old. He's one of, if not the youngest quarterback in the NFL. Um, he was, you know, a guy with a lot of potential in college. And, you know, I think he's definitely a guy that, you know, he's mobile, um, he's accurate, but he's definitely got a lot of things to learn. And I would like to see him get a red shirt here and let Sam Darnold play out the season. You got a very, very smart offensive coach right on your team right now. 
that I think they could get a lot of uh, out of Sam Darnold. And with the receiver talent that they have, I think they can be competitive. They do play in a very, very um, tough division. Um, their division is going to be very tough with the Detroit Lions, the Green Bay Packers, and the Chicago Bears. So that's not going to make it easier. But I would like for them to let um, J.J. McCarthy learn the system for a year. Um, and I've, I've even heard reports that, you know, J.J. McCarthy might be close, closer to Nick Mullins than he is to Sam Darnold on the depth chart. So he's got a lot to yeah. grow. Um, but I think J.J. McCarthy can be a great quarterback someday, just not right now. And Sam Darnold gives him the best chance to win right now. Yeah, I get that. I, I, I'm not really convinced J.J. McCarthy is really that good, to be honest. <laughs> I think he was – like, I think you're being too nice. I, I don't think he's that good. I think he was good in college. I think he was a good. He was in a good situation. But I don't know. I, I don't think he's – I don't think he's going to be an NFL, uh, a very good NFL quarterback. I mean, that doesn't mean – look, he's going to play at some point. I mean, you have to remember, there. Were, I mean, I don't know how it's going to go next year, but last year it was notorious for injuries. There was about – there was slightly more than two quarterbacks per team that started uh, because, because, every, because quarterbacks were constantly getting injured. And not only that, but from my experience as a Jet fan with Sam Darnold, there's always a lot of drama – just in terms of like, oh, are we going to keep Darnold? Are we, uh, is he going to start next game? Because everything has just been so bad, has been like so up and down. I, I can predict how a lot of this is going to go. Sam Darnold is going to have maybe a few good games, like a few flashes in the pan, and it's going to be like a really big story, like how good Sam Darnold was. And then it's going to go back down to being like, all right, maybe he's go. Then he's going to come back down to earth. And it's going to be all right. So maybe Sam Darnold really isn't that good. Should they should they start JJ McCarthy? Like that's going to be like the whole thing. <laughs> that's going to be like the whole thing for the Vikings. I mean, in in terms of like it, their division is tough, mainly because of the Lions and Packers. I would say the Bears are still a big question mark. We don't really know how good they're going to be. Um, the thing is, it's not even that their division is necessarily that tough. It's just that the Vikings it, aren't really supposed to be that good. Uh, you know, if Sam Darnold's your starting quarterback, you're probably not going to be that good of a team anyway. So, I, I mean, sure, their division is tough. I mean, given that they, they're not going to be able to uh, beat out the Lions or the Packers, they, they're like a step ahead of them. Um, but, you know, it, it's I, – I think the Vikings will likely be the last place team, I would say. Uh, that that's That's my prediction. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I know you're, you know, don't, don't sound too high on the Bears, but I really think this division has three teams that are going to be competing for a playoff spot. As you did state, you know, the Lions and the Packers um, should definitely be in the playoffs. Definitely the Lions, Packers should sneak in as well as a wild card team. But the Bears are very talented. They had a pretty good defense last year. They're bringing in Caleb Williams, who I think is a superb talent. Um, they got DeAndre Swift, they got Keenan Allen, they got DJ Moore, and they got Roma Dunze. Um, so I really think they have a lot of talent. It's all going to come down to Caleb Williams and how great and how high uh, you are on Caleb Williams. If you love Caleb Williams, you're probably going to like the Bears this season. If you don't, yeah. then you're probably not going to like the Bears. There's definitely a lot of crazy predictions. I've seen guys like Nick Wright say the Bears are going to win the NFC um, championship. I'm not going to go that far. Um, but um, I do think that uh, you know Caleb Williams can have a great season, and I do think that the Bears can sneak in um, as a playoff card, um, playoff team, wild card team, or maybe just miss the playoffs and be on on the outside looking in. Yeah, Caleb Williams right now is like the ultimate media darling, um, and I, I don't like using that term. Uh, I mean, it's not his fault, but <laughs> um, it, it, like the sports media, so much of the sports media is like so big on Caleb Williams. Uh, I feel like it's only ever going to hurt him. Like I think it's it can only hurt him because the expectations right now are just so high. It I mean like the expectations they're setting for him are just so high. Uh, I don't really I am really not that high on the Bears. I am not saying they're going to be bad or they won't be better with Caleb Williams. But how do we know how good Caleb? Like I'm not really convinced that Caleb Williams is like oh first ballot Hall of Famer. Like I don't know. I'm not really convinced of that at all. I have to see him play first. Uh, he was good. He was a good college quarterback for sure. I don't know how much that's going to translate to the NFL. I mean, and even if Caleb Williams has a good year, I, I mean, the problem with all of this hype about him is that if it, it's almost like unrealistic expectations are setting for him. I mean, if he's not great his rookie year, which most quarterbacks aren't great their rookie, like they show 
quarterbacks can show a lot of promise their rookie year, but they can uh, and a lot of potential, but but they don't always but they rarely ever like blow you, but they rarely ever have amazing rookie years. Um to me, it's all it's almost gotten to the point where Caleb Williams has to have some type of amazing season. And to me, it's like I think that Caleb Williams' expectations are more about him as an individual, like how he plays individually. For, like for a lot of quarterbacks, it's all about like the narrative is all about, well, can they make the playoffs? Can he, can he win a Super Bowl? Whatever the case may be, like somebody like Aaron Rodgers. It's not really just about Aaron Rodgers as an indiv- like how he plays individually. It's about his whole team. Like it's about him carrying the Jets to a Super Bowl. Or it's same thing with Mahomes. Like, oh, is he going to win a third Super Bowl in a row? Whatever the case may be. With Caleb Williams, it's really more about him. Like, the most realistic expectation would be about how he is individually. To me, if the Bears don't make the playoffs, it's not the end of the world. They're in a tough division. The Lions and Packers are head and shoulders ahead of them right now. The Bears didn't make the playoffs last year. And if Caleb Williams has a decent year, then all right, cool. But, like, this whole thing of, like, this, this whole like thing from so much of the sports media, which is like they're gonna they're gonna go to the playoffs and they're gonna win the NFC. I mean, it, like the likely does anybody actually believe that that is a likely thing to happen? <laughs> like that just sounds so silly. Yeah, and um, it's definitely silly when you're talking NFC championship. But honestly, Nick, does Caleb Williams with the talent that the Bears you know have brought in, Caleb Williams probably doesn't have to be a first ballot Hall of Famer to get this team into the playoffs. I mean, usually, typically, 10 wins usually get you into the playoffs on an average year. Maybe if you're very lucky, nine wins. But usually 10 um, is get you in. There were about a seven-win team last year. And that was with, you know, just one good receiver and DJ Moore. Now I think they got three great receivers on their team. I think their defense is going to be even better. Um, you got Montez Sweat in his second year. Um, I think they got a very, very talented young secondary led by Jalen Johnson. And you brought in DeAndre Swift. Their offensive line's young, so that should be improved. You got Cole Komet. So, you know, there's a lot of things on this team. And I don't think Caleb Williams necessarily has to be a top 10 elite quarterback to get this team the extra two or three wins that they didn't get last year to get him into the playoffs. Right. Well, so here's – so, you know, with, with a lot of, like, this talk about Caleb Williams and the expectations, so I just looked at – so I have the – I have NFL futures in front of me on DraftKings. The Bears are even to for like you know how on their futures to see who makes the playoffs. The Bears are minus one ten to make it and minus one ten not to make it. So the odds are like fifty fifty for uh, the odds of uh, according to the odds of the Bears making the playoffs are fifty fifty. So th- this kind of proves my point a little bit that like all right the expectations that some people are setting are just a little too high. I mean, like winning, uh, like him leading the team to an NFC championship. Like when, you know, it's 50, 50 can kind of go. That's what the, that's what Vegas is saying. Yeah. I honestly think that's, you know, spot on because like, like I stated before, they're going to be probably the third best team in their division. So that already puts you in a tough spot. You're not going to be a division winner and you're already going to have one wild card spot taken off. So right. that right there makes, you know, slim, slim pickings for the Chicago Bears. That's why I think, you know, I think a good season for them is either just sneaking into the playoffs as a seventh seed or maybe just missing it um, as an eighth or ninth seed and maybe even winning, like, just nine games. Honestly, right. I think, you know, a nine-win season um, would actually be a pretty good mark for them. If Caleb Williams could go out there, show some promise, um, maybe hit the 4,000-yard mark that, you know, the Bears quarterbacks, um, you know, have a history of not doing – um, maybe throw for, you know, 20 plus touchdowns, you know, not be too crazy with interceptions and win nine wins, um, win nine games. Um, I think that would be very, uh, very suffice for all uh, Bears fans. Yeah, no, I was just saying the same thing. If they go nine and eight or eight and nine and miss the playoffs. I mean, by the way, the odd number of games in the NFL drives me crazy. <laughs> uh, everything like that just drives me crazy. They're going to change that. But anyway, um, yeah, if they go eight and eight and nine or nine and eight and miss the playoffs by a little bit, and Caleb Williams, I mean, it's not just about the team success, really. It's really more about Caleb, Caleb Williams as an individual, really. Like, it's not just about the team success. It's really more about him, and he plays decently well. I think that that would be fine. I think that would be perfectly okay. 
like for his rookie season. Now, if they do that well, if they do well in spite of him and they have to like bench him and things like that, that would obviously be a problem. But to me, the Caleb Williams pressure is not as high as it's going to be a year from now, going into a second season. Yeah, like, I agree. Uh, so uh, we do have to talk a little bit about this. Brandon Ayuk's future is a bit up in the air. Uh, the Niners are looking to trade him, uh, although Brandon Ayuk has to approve of these trades uh, before they send him anywhere uh, because, you know, he requested the trade. Uh, the Patriots apparently are out from getting Brandon Ayuk. I don't blame him. Uh, the Patriots team right now is not is just so behind. The Patriots right now are just so behind the eight ball that what is br- paying Brandon Ayuk exorbitant amounts of money going to do for them? That's what I'm assuming there. Uh their reasoning was uh, it would it uh, it would just look ridiculous uh, if they had done. I mean, like there's only so much Brandon Ayuk can do on the Patriots, but there's a few other teams from, that are in the running. The Browns are in there. The Steelers are in there. Uh, is there another team I'm forgetting? Um, no, I think that uh, pretty much sums up the teams that they're discussing right now. Um, for Brandon Ayuk, I mean, the guy is very impressive. He's got great hands. He's a great route runner. He's improved every single season. I know he plays in Kyle Shanahan's system, which obviously could do great with a lot of great players. And since the 49ers have played some of their other stars like Christian McCaffrey and Debo Samuel, um, they have to replace Brandon Ayuk. They can't afford to give him the money. And like I said, with Kyle Shanahan's system, he can replace guys, even elite guys, um, at that um, easily. Um, you know, he could just plug and play guys and, you know, make it effective. Um, but I do think Brandon Ayuk has established himself as one of the 10 best receivers in the NFL. And I think if you're a top 10 receiver that's only 24, 25 years old with potential to still improve and maybe be a top three, top five receiver, that warrants a $30 million a year plus contract. And obviously right now the 49ers aren't going to give that out. So he's going to have to, you know, find a trade partner. I don't blame him like you said, Nick. Um, you know, I wouldn't want to go to the Patriots either. Um, as talented as Drake may, uh, may be and as high as his ceiling is, um, I, you can't risk his career on that. But it does seem like no matter where he goes, he ain't, he's not going to have one of these elite quarterbacks. There's still questions with Deshaun Watson with the Cleveland Browns. Hasn't looked the same since he's uh, been back from his suspension and his time off. So there's questions there. Obviously, we know there's been questions for a long time with Pittsburgh's quarterback situation. Russell Wilson is not the same player. And Justin Fields is still hasn't proven to be an elite passer yet. Um, you know, I could be wrong. Maybe Russell Wilson could have a resurgence or maybe Justin Fields could break out. But that seems very unlikely. So either way, Brandon Ayuk's going to have to sacrifice something and probably not play with an elite quarterback anymore. But if he could get his money um, and play on a playoff team like the Browns, um, it does uh, you know, be unfortunate the Browns would have to give up Amari Cooper. But they do have Jerry Judy. Um, they do have uh, David Njoku. And they do have Nick Chubb coming back with that elite defense who was just in the playoffs last year. So I think the Browns would probably be the, uh, the best fit and be the best team. Um, and on Pittsburgh, if he was on there with George Pickens and they could get a little bit out of their quarterback, um, Pittsburgh may be able to sneak in the playoffs. But right now, I would go with the Browns um, as the best fit for Brandon Ayuk. Right. No, no, no. I, I For me, it's like I don't blame Brandon Ayuk for looking for more money because he's one of the – like based on him watching like a whole bunch of other wide receivers get paid, like Tyree Kill, Justin Jefferson, he, uh, he, he obviously – looks at that and says that he should be able to get paid that money. But at the, but at the same time, if I'm the 49ers, I'm looking at him and I'm like, well, yeah, well I'm not going to pay that money. He's just not worth it at all, um, which he isn't to the Niners because he just – the, the Niners are such a stacked roster that Ayuk is just not as valuable to them as he would be to another team. I mean, even if Brandon Ayuk were to just – even without Brandon Ayuk, the Niners aren't really going to lose much of a step. Uh, even without him, it's just it, it, that's not a knock on his play. It's just the nature of wide receivers. Uh, it, it, like you know, and it, like uh, NFL teams don't really lose that much without them. Uh, it it's just the nature of it. Like it, it, like wide receivers are not as valuable as quarterbacks are. Like so, it just really like the Niners really wouldn't be losing much of a step, and you can't pay everybody. You can't pay everybody, so they they would they would absolutely the Niners to them to me it's like a no brainer to them. It seems like it would be a no brainer to them that they were that they aren't going to pay Brandon Ayuk. Yeah, and 
like you said, I think right now the team, you know, runs through Christian McCaffrey. That's why McCaffrey was one of the guys that did get paid. I do think Brandon Ayuk as just the overall receiver talent and just a straight up receiver is better than Debo Samuel, but Debo Samuel is more versatile. And with Kyle Shanahan's system, he has a guy in Debo Samuel who's going to be cheaper and more versatile. And Kyle Shanahan likes those guys that are gadget players that you can put at receiver, you can put at running back, and make the offense even harder to stop. Obviously, you know, any offense that has Brandon Ayuk on it's going to be better. Um, but I think it's a luxury that they don't necessarily have to have. And they got some other good receivers as well. I think Jennings is a good receiver as well for them. He just hasn't been utilized a lot. And I think we'll see that more if Ayuk's off the team. They also drafted Ricky Purcell from Florida, who's got tremendous hands and is a tremendous route runner. And I think he's going to fit right into Kyle Shanahan's system perfectly. So right. I really don't think they're going to miss a step. And I think it's going to work out for both parties. I think Ayuk will get his money. He'll go on a playoff caliber team, may not get the Super Bowl ring, um, but he'll get his money and compete uh, for playoffs. And then the 49ers will just move on like usual and still compete for Super Bowls. Yeah. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so speaking of all that, uh, yeah, yeah, like I said, there's still going to be a Super Bowl caliber team with or without him. Uh, and that's just usually the case with wide receivers, like losing a star wide receiver, which brings us into, uh, you know, the Chiefs, they didn't lose a step without Tyreek Hill. They went two Super Bowls in a row without him. Um, is The NFL released their top 100 list. It was a bit asinine. I have it. In, first of all, I, I don't I don't get this whole 100 thing. There's no way they're putting in a lot of effort into who the top 100 players are. I mean, it, it's like... To me, it's like, all right, top 10 might, top five, top 10 might be a list. Top 100, are you really like, you're really kind of splitting hairs between 98, 99, and 100. Like, I just always found the 100 thing to be a bit ridiculous. In football, football is not a sport where you can really compare players at different positions. Um, Like in basketball, like in basketball, for instance, you can compare the legacy of all basketball players regardless of what position they play, whether point guard, center, it doesn't matter. In baseball, even, you can kind of do it, although it's hard to compare position players and pitchers. But in football, it's so different because every position has varying roles and varying levels of value. So it is vastly more difficult to judge who a better quote-unquote football player is out of the top 100. Um, But I'll just give you the top 10 that they've – so number 10 is Max Crosby, 9, Tra- Travis Kelsey, 8, TJ Watt, 7, Trent Williams, 6, Chris Jones, 5, Miles Garrett, 4, Patrick Mahomes, 3, McCaffrey, 2, Lamar Jackson, and 1, Tyree Hill. All right. So this is a ridiculous – I'm just looking at the top 10 right now. Like I- I'm not even – I don't even know if we're going to go through the whole thing. That is asinine. Tyree yeah. Hill being number one. I mean, okay – He's all, he's great to watch, but he still is a wide receiver. How can you put him over Mahomes, who's already won three Super Bowls? Uh, Mahomes is objectively much, at least much more valuable to his team than Tyreek Hill. Like like I said, without when they lost, what would have happened if the if the Chiefs lost Mahomes as opposed to when they lost Tyreek <laughs> Hill? Uh, would they yeah. have won two Super Bowls? No. Nah. No, I, I absolutely agree with you, Nick. And like you said, how can you rank the guy um, over, you know, Patrick Mahomes when Patrick Mahomes has won the Super Bowl every year that he hasn't played with Tyree Kill? Um, you know, I, I think Tyree Kill, obviously, if you want to have him as the top receiver, go ahead. In my opinion, I think when healthy, Justin Jefferson is the best receiver. But Tyree Kill last year was the best receiver in football last year because Jefferson was out most of the year. So if you want to have Tyree Kill as the top receiver, yes, go ahead. But there's no way you're going to rank him ahead of those elite quarterbacks. Um, it's something that, you know, definitely upset me, Brett. Um, how is Josh Allen not in the top 10? Um, I don't understand this yeah. argument of Lamar Jackson is way better than Josh Allen. Yeah, Lamar Jackson's won two MVPs in the regular season. But Josh Allen is the much superior player in the playoffs. I mean, look at their playoff stats. Yeah, Josh Allen loses to Patrick Mahomes. But he's literally going toe for toe with Patrick Mahomes. Right. He's going to turn the ball over in the playoffs. So you could talk about turnovers all you want. But when it comes to the playoffs, when the Bills are losing, Josh Allen is playing phenomenal and not turning the ball over. 
His defense has let him down every single time against the Chiefs. Um, and what is he supposed to do? You're playing against Patrick Mahomes and you're playing against Travis Kelsey. And the Buffalo Bills got a guy who was in retirement trying to trying to cover Travis Kelsey and A.J. Klein. And you're going to put that game and blame Josh Allen for that game. I mean, Josh Allen can't do any more than what he's done in the playoffs. I think he's been a great quarterback in the playoffs. And honestly, I think outside of Patrick Mahomes, I think Josh Allen is the second best quarterback in football. So for Lamar Jackson to be ahead of him is definitely asinine. And for him to be ahead of Patrick Mahomes as well yeah. is definitely asinine. I, I um, was... It's a popularity contest, I think, when it comes to these players voting on these lists. Well, yeah, well, obviously. Does anybody really think Lamar Jackson is better than Patrick Mahomes? Like, that, that's just ridiculous. Um, I don't know how anybody believes that, and, like, let alone Tyree Kill. Uh, is, that, is that how it works? The players vote on it? Yeah, so I think what they usually do, um, usually after the season, they'll have the players vote on what their top 20 is. They usually have about roughly 500 uh, players throughout the NFL that vote on their top 20. And then obviously, you know, you're going to get a lot of different names. So that's how you go from the top 20 to a top 100. Yeah, weird. So, yeah, I mean, by the way, when you look at these lists, they always seem to be a bit ridiculous. ESPN releases lists like this all the time, and it's always during the offseason. It's always during the summer when – it's when you know during a slow time for sports is always when it happens it seems like um so i i mean i i don't think any reasonable person can look at this list and think that it makes any bit of sense at all yeah um, I, I mean i don't mean to bash lamar i think lamar is a great quarterback but i mean the guy does choke in the playoffs and look at how talented of the team he has he's had a very very talented team last season and if you're gonna sit there and say that Lamar Jackson or Josh Allen choked more than Lamar Jackson. I don't see how you can make that argument. Josh Allen played 10 times better in his game against the Chiefs than Lamar Jackson did. But yeah. um, it's a popularity contest. Um, one more other thing I want to talk about this list that they got wrong. Um, the cornerbacks um, are absolutely atrocious. Um, I know Jalen Ramsey is an OG and he's been a good player for a while, but he's not nearly in the conversation for the best cornerback in the league anymore. I think Sauce Gardner is the best cornerback in football. So I don't see how you could have Jalen Ramsey in that conversation. And how does Jalen Johnson, an all-pro, who played like a top-five cornerback for the Bears, not even make the top 100, but Aaron Rodgers, who played four plays, makes the list? I don't understand it. Yeah. It, it, yeah, I mean, we all agree, I, I think, that uh, – I mean, cornerback shelf life is very very short. Like, you're the best corner for a few years, and then you sort of fade away. That always seems to be how it is with corners. Um, all right, so thanks for tuning in, everybody. Uh, this is another episode of Moving the Goalpost. You can follow this show at it, uh, at MTGPETB on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. You can follow me on Twitter at Nick Demart. Uh, you can follow uh, you, you can follow Anthony. Well, what is your Twitter at? At Ballister five five five. Okay, Ballister. I remember it was something. It was something simple. Um, you can follow uh, you you, uh, you can follow uh, this. You can follow. Uh, all empty the bench shows on youtube.com slash gtb network and listen to them at etbpodcast.com. Uh, we'll be back next week. See ya.